we might make a start with this our um, April 2020 Soils Network of Knowledge webinar. And now I'd like to introduce Essen Tavakoli, who's a research scientist here at DPI, with over 10 years of research and consulting experience. Essen's areas of expertise cover soil fertility and crop nutrition, subsoil constraints, environmental nanotechnology and soil plant interactions. He's also responsible for the soil science laboratories at our Wagga Wagga Agricultural Institute, where work in soil chemistry and physics is undertaken. Esan has been involved in and led a number of projects co-funded by um, organisations such as GRDC, ARC, DAF and the Australian Synchrotron. He currently leads the New South Wales component of various national GRDC programs on improving wheat yields in sodic and dispersive soils, the amelioration of sodic and acidic soils, and understanding crop responses to modern fertilisation techniques with a focus on improving subsoil fertility, which is why he's giving us an update today on this topic, the magnitude of crop uh, productivity improvements on hostile subsoils. So that's the introduction bit. Thank you, Abby, and good morning to everyone who is um, online at the moment. It's good to see quite a number of people here. Um, before I start, um, I just make a couple of comments here. So um, there is a large group of um, research scientists, technical officers, and collaborators in other other organizations behind the presentation I'm talking today. Although I will focus on New South Wales component, but I just wanted to acknowledge. Um, a large contribution from all the co-authors of this presentation and many others that I probably didn't um, um, have this enough space to put here. So highly appreciate the um, collaborative work. And um, so the introduction that I like to, to start with is um, to improve crop productivity in hostile soils, we often have two approaches. Approach one is to manage that soil or hostile soil, depends on what the um, problem is or improving germplasm or crop performance or genetic material in those hostile conditions. And, and in an in a optimal condition, the best approach is to merge um, a crop performance or germplasm improvement with soil management to provide additive effects. So the first part of my presentation today will be an update and overview of the, of the past three years of work that we have been doing um, on soil management of some sodic um, highly alkaline subsoils. And if the time is okay, I'll probably touch based on some of the work we've been doing in crop improvement space as well. So first of all, I would like to start with the uh, severity of the issue. So um, subsoil constraints, they can be uh, several constraints, acidity, salinity, and sodicity. Uh, today, my focus of the presentation will be on sodic alkaline soils. Um, and, and this is um, a classic example of a recent publication um, um, expressing the yield gap associated with sodic subsoils. So in terms of the loss in economy of agricultural production, those sodic subsoils across the grains industry uh, farming systems of Australia from north to southeast and to the western um, um, uh, regions of the grains production, the estimate is about $1,300 million per year. So uh, in terms of um, loss opportunity, it's a huge issue. And even a slight improvement in soil management or crop performance to um, improve that productivity can result in high um, benefits in uh, for for the farming for the farming production so it's a significant issue that requires um, attention from scientific and and development point of view um, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to discuss um, um, what is a sodic soil what a sodic soil is and this is basically for those people who are not familiar with sodic soils, many of the attendees I can see they are experts in this area. Um, often uh, we tend to confuse between salinity and sodicity and their interaction. Um, in here, a sodic soil, uh, basically if you have a clay particle, that clay particle has a number of different cations and those cations are 
having a different behavior in terms of uh, making the soil structure. So very similar to a human bone structure that uh, we know we need more calcium in our bone for a better structure, those soil aggregates also requires more calcium to maintain the aggregation. And in a sodic soil, the proportion of those exchangeable cations, so it's not soluble, but it's exchangeable cations on the clay surface. The proportion of sodium, which is a smaller in terms of its size of, um, of molecule compared to calcium and magnesium, if it is higher behind, behind a certain threshold, those clay particles tend to, tend to have a poor structure. And what happens when it comes in touch with water, uh, we observe clay dispersion. And that is the, um, the photo in a Petri dish that you have on the right hand side of this slide. So um, if the proportion of sodium or potassium or magnesium is higher uh, beyond the threshold compared to the whole soil exchangeable capacity, uh, we have some sort of issue. Okay. What happens if you have this issue? Uh, first of all, as those um, colloidal particles start to move into the subsoil, they can block the macro and macro pores. And at the event of even lower high, uh, rainfall, we can experience waterlogging situation. As the profile dries out, those uh, colloidal dispersion can actually sit like a concrete and make it very difficult for the roots to penetrate into the into the subsoil. So we have a structural problem in these soils and and um, if it happens in the surface, like our um, Queensland um, colleagues uh, experience in their farming system, we can also have germination issue. But um, this, and, and on top of that, these imbalanced chemistry of a sodic um, high pH alkaline subsoil can impose some sort of nutritional toxicity toxicities or deficiencies for the crop production. Okay, so this is this was and and this was a, what what a sodic soil is. A saline soil is um, saline when you have high soluble salt concentrations in the soil solution, not in the exchangeable phase. So these are completely two different phenomena. And what happens is that you can experience a sodic soil, a saline soil, or a saline sodic soil. Compare, um, depends on which situation you are. And if, if you want to complicate this story further um, and pH uh, comes to the story, we have up to 16 different categories of sodic and saline soils according to their pH. Today, I want to discuss only one category, a subsoil that has high sodicity and high pH, so an alkaline sodic subsoils. When, and I will explain what are the constraints associated with, with this condition. So this is slide um, it is summarizing um, all these different constraints and sodic soils and saline soils and acidic soils into, into one major issue in the farming system. Whatever situation is out there in terms of soil constraints, they result in one problem in common for farming, and that is a poor water use efficiency. The concept of the work that we are developing here in the, and, and in the future is how can we actually improve the water use efficiency in hostile soil conditions. Um, so the water is in the subsoil and the crop root cannot have access to that water because of a hostile condition that avoid or prevent the penetration of the root to the, to the deeper subsoil. And, and then we have a reduction in yield and reduced profitability. So for the rest of this project and this discussion today, I want you to think about um, the, the whole philosophy and concept of this sort of work, both in crop improvement and soil management is to improve water use efficiency of the farming systems. Um, our colleagues, um, uh, Associate Professor Peter Sale has demonstrated in the past in the high rainfall area of Victoria that by um, adding organic amendments into the subsoil, we have a potential to transform that poorly structured hostile subsoil. So this is this is an example of the subsoil from about 30 to 40 centimeter. Um, and after four years of subsoil manuring, he was able to demonstrate how that structure can be transformed into the into the in a better structure that you can see on the right hand side of this slide. And those transformations were associated with um, yield benefits of up to 70%. So it's a remarkable opportunity here that we are trying to adopt with a broader range of products and more 
uh, viable um, management. Um, I give you an example of the work we did in a in a in a site in southern New South Wales. Um, we call it um, a RAND site because it's located in a regional township of RAND in southern New South Wales. And I just want to explain to you what the problem is in this site. Okay, so first of all, let's focus on the pH. Um, as you can see, the pH of this soil starts from a slightly acidic to neutral topsoil, and the pH increases by um, increasing depth. So it reaches about 9, 9.2 as you go below 20, 30 centimeter. And this increase in pH in the subsoil at that, at that pH of 9 has consequences in terms of high soluble species of carbonate and bicarbonate. So um, if the pH was between 8 and 8.5, it and doesn't and wouldn't go be beyond that. It um, it didn't have that toxic effect, but as the pH goes up, it's because of the solubility of carbonate, sodium carbonate, and bicarbonate um, species uh, that can affect your root growth. And there is a paper in the handout on this topic about the speciations of um, uh, anions and how that um, interplay with the pH. Um, at the same time. The ESP and here the exchangeable sodium percentage is the indications of um, how sodic a soil can be. Um, again, increases with increasing depths. So, if a non-sodic topsoil in this um, in this case, and it reaches up to 20 or 30 percent in the subsoil, which brings um, uh, dispersion. And as you can see in the slide be, uh, on that photo uh, below, the, below, the, below the graph, you can see increasing dispersion by increasing depths. Um, so we have a poor structure. The, the property experiences water logging even at the low rainfall event. And we can also expect elemental toxicities in this, in this site. And at the end of uh, this list, we have electrical conductivity. So EC is um, a um, an indication of how saline the soil can be. Above EC4, soils are considered to be saline. However, it's about EC of seven that the crop sees some sort of yield penalty. So the, the site is mainly non-saline in the, in the top 30, 40 centimeters. The salinity increases with increasing depths. Okay, so we have a situation here that we have a high pH in the subsoil. We have a high ESP in the subsoil, and, and we are trying to see if soil management can address some of these issues. However, our management um, of the subsoil uh, based on putting amendments can only manipulate up to a depth of 40, 45 centimeters at the, at the, at the at the most. So we decided to test a number of different amendments in this property. We applied the amendments in 2017, so it's a one-off application, and based on that one-off application, we are monitoring the changes of the subsoil, uh, chemistry, physics, and also crop productivity over a number of years to see if we get residual effect. So very quickly, I'll run you through the list of treatments that we had in this paddock. So we had either deep or surface application of organic amendments, inorganic amendments, or their combination. For example, we use gypsum. Gypsum is one of the most common um, treatments for, um, uh, uh, for sodic salts. Uh, we use some sort of organic amendments with different qualities. We use chicken manure, we use pea hay straw, and also we use wheat stubble. All of these are pelletized because our machinery on the right hand side can only handle pelletized uh, products to go into the subsoil. Okay, so the reason we used manure, it has a high nitrogen and other nutrients in it, plus organic carbon, or sorry, carbon if you like to call it. And our plant based material or the farm grown biomass that we pelletize them. Um, we use a legume crop and a wheat crop because they have a um, differential carbon to nitrogen ratio. And we were interested to see if that additional nitrogen in a legume plant, farm grown biomass can actually improve the aggregation of the subsoil by affecting the microbial activity. We also had a rip only treatment. So we wanted to see what is the effect of ripping only and removing that from the background effect of amendments. And um, in some of these um, uh, situations, we also had a combination of, for example, deep placement of PHI plus gypsum plus that uh, liquid uh, um, fertilizer that 
that we had. Um, in terms of the liquid um, um, uh, nutrients that we had, we matched the end content of that uh, uh, liquid um, nutrients according to the end content of our manure. So it was matching the same amount that went into the subsoil. Okay, so we have deep placement, surface placement, and the combination of some of the inorganic and organic amendments, and I will explain why we decided to combine them. So the, the trial looks like this. This is the third um, year of the trial that we just completed in the end of 2019. I just explained here in the first year, we had a barley crop. In the second year, we had a wheat crop. And in 2019, we had a canola crop. And first of all, I started with explaining the yield responses of the 2019 results. So on the left hand side, we see the control treatment that yielded just below 2.5 tons per hectare. And um, we only experienced um, positive responses, significant positive responses in terms of yield benefit in some of the deep placed uh, treatments. And it was important to, to see those treatments which performed in the third year also were among those treatments that performed um, the best in the first and the second year of the treatment. So um, in terms of best performing treatments on the right hand side of this graph, you see uh, deep P high plus nutrient deep gypsum and deep manure are some of the best. Um, so, um, and, and, and I will explain some of the mechanisms that we think is responsible for getting these responses. The rip only treatment actually gave us um, some positive 8%, um, um, which is not significant statistically, but um, it's interesting that in the first and the second year of this study, uh, it wasn't among the best treatments or a, 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 among a, um, a positive responsing treatments. Um, so deep placement tends to uh, provide us with some sort of um, uh, significant uh, yield responses, and we don't often observe um, significant responses from the surface applications, um, definitely for the first and the second year. So in the second year of this um, uh, work with the, surf with, with the wheat crop variety Lanza, we had up to 53% yield increase. And, and that was in our, when we combined deep P high plus gypsum plus MPK. Um, I'd like to start talking about some of the mechanisms and then in more details, I will uh, explain why we think this is happening. So um, as I mentioned, these subsoils has high pH, high um, ESP and also um, a very poor structure and disparative um, behavior. If I um, look at the trend in terms of um, behavior of some of these treatments, deep gypsum application, for example, uh, it didn't perform um, in the first year, but it started to show us some positive responses in the second and in the third year of the um, experiment. And the reason for that is when the gypsum is placed in the subsoil, it takes a while for that to react with the soil moisture and, and the soil chemistry to provide that uh, depression of the dispersion. So it takes a while and we have started to see some trends in the second and in the third year. Um, in, in regards with the deep pH and also our farm grown biomass, even deep wheat, um, we see an improved aggregation in these subsoils, which is related to microbial activity and the work that one of our research scientists is doing on mechanis mechanisms of this aggregation. So we always see a better performance when we combine the organic amendments with inorganic amendments. And I think that is when we start talking about um, addressing multiple soil constraints and how we can actually, with combining gypsum and, and organic amendments with dual mode of action, improve these uh, structural issues of the subsoils and the chemistry of the subsoil. So um, if I want to, um, summarize the responses, cumulative responses of different amendments over the three years in this paddock. Um, the deep P plus gypsum plus nutrient, deep gypsum and deep P high are sitting on, on, on the extreme positive part of this, uh, this graph and 
consistently perform better over three years compared to other treatments. Um, surface gypsum, rip only, and even deep liquid um, uh, nutrients, however, did not really result in any significant benefits in improving crop response. So this is percentage, this is cumulative yield response relative to the control treatments. Okay, so increase over of the crop yield over three years in the field. And, and so this is encouraging for us because I think we started to see some sort of consistent behavior from our treatments um, over the life of the project so far. Um, so what are the other observations? Um, an important area here um, is water use efficiency and water use. And what happens if we have um, a better root growth in the subsoil, uh, that root growth can actually improve the water uptake and water use efficiency of the crop. We started to see in the from the third year of the project an increase in a number of active roots in the subsoil um, compared to the control treatments or some surface amendment treatments treatments. Uh, we use the core break techniques to take different cores over each plot, um, as you can see in these photos. And when we look at the number of visible roots in, in that depth of 20 to 40 centimeter, you will see some of our treatments, deep manure and deep pH, and also even deep wheat and deep gypsum, um, resulting a significant increase in the number of visible roots in the subsoil. So this is an extremely encouraging because if we cannot encourage root penetration and more root accumulation in that subsoil, um, we can't actually change the pattern of water use and achieve a crop response. Um, from that, we are looking at uh, the aggregate stability. So it's important to demonstrate here whether the deep placement of some of these amendments um, encourage um, improve the soil structure. So this is field-based samples, and what we are observing, and 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 the white and the black bars here are showing the macro and micro ag aggregates. Simply, you want more of um, the macros, which are the the white bars, and less of the micro aggregates. So. What is interesting is that the observation is that if you have just ripping only the second bar from the left hand side, we often see a damaged structural um, 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 issues into the soil compared to the control, compared to doing nothing. However, when you have some amendments in the system, that amendment starts from the second and the third year of the um, um, that one of application to improve that um, the degradation, structural degradation. So not only that ripping only effect of 40% uh, reduction in the macro aggregates is being depressed by adding some of the deep um, uh, amendments, but we started to see some positive um, structural improvements when we have deep wheat and deep pH high into the subsoil. And, and we explain the mechanisms of how organic amendments improve the soil structure in a current number, a number of current publications and a couple of them that is on the way in the near future. And please see the handouts for this. Um, so, so far, if I go back again, we see a better root penetration into the subsoil. We see a better aggregation and the two important um, um, uh, other factors are water supply and water storage. So we are also measuring the hydraulic saturated hydraulic conductivity in field, and we were able to demonstrate that in the in 2019 season, um, the hydraulic conductivity of of those plots affected by a number of these treatments significantly improved compared to control. So there is always a re a ripping effect on improving that hydraulic conductivity. So um, we see a 200% improvement in rip only treatments um, compared to the control. And on top of that, when we have a deep pH or a deep wheat application in this case, we see even further significant uh, improvement in uh, uh, infiltration rates of water. And this is very important because a sodic subsoil often tends to experience transient water logging. And if you are able to demonstrate that work 
or this amendment improving the subsoil structure to let a better improvement in infiltration rate, then it's a it's a quite an important um, factor that will affect the uh, water storage and water supply by these um, hostile subsoils. Um, um, we also measure the crop water use, um, and this is um, although I haven't converted the the neutron probe data into a volumetric water content, but simply I just want you to think about um, if this graph on and the next graphs that I'm going to show, if we see a shift to the left hand side of the uh, of the graph, that means that soil profile is getting drier and drier, and that means it's more water uptake by the crop. So um, yield improvement is always associated with an improvement uh, in the crop water use from the subsoil. So if we cannot demonstrate here that the water use is not changing, then changing of that water use to biomass and grain yield is impossible. Um, if I compare two treatments here, control and deep nutrient application, you see that they are pretty much the same. Um, and this is at antesis, which is a critical time of um, crop uh, physiological life. And we start to see a drier soil profile in that subsoil when we have some other treatments that also uh, improve the crop productivity. And these are the two top performing treatments, DP plus gypsum plus nutrient or DP hay alone. Okay, so in average, we see about 10 or 15 percent improvement in that crop water use um, in this situation, which is associated um, with increased yield as well. Um, so I wanted now just to put some simple graphs together to summarize uh, some of the mechanisms that we think is underlying uh, crop performance in these soils. Okay, so let's focus on water first. Um, the control treatments in our subsoil has a pH of about nine and gypsum application often reduces that pH. So this is very important because as I mentioned in the beginning, we can experience um, uh, carbonate and bicarbonate toxicities in these soils and um, reduction in pH will eliminate that toxicity. What happens is that gypsum will react with soluble um, uh, carbonate, sodium carbonate, and it participates that carbonate as calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate participation lowers the pH. So that's very um, important. That depression in pH also depress the dispersion of the soil. So it's very important because the high pH itself is one of the reasons that the soil is disperses. Organic matter or nutrients plus organic matter doesn't have that influence on pH. So it's a pure gypsum effect. Then we look at ESP. Yes, we can um, lower the ESP with application of gypsum, but it's not a lot. The amount of gypsum that we need in that subsoil to lower the ESP from 12% to, for example, 6% is so much that the application rate is not really meaningful. So if you see that 2% um, reduction in ESP, it doesn't really help to reduce the dispersion of the soil, but the gypsum effect is more pronounced on the pH. Um, again, the organic matter or organic matter plus nutrient doesn't have much influence and on soil ESP. But what it has, it's on uh, soil microbial biomass carbon. And uh, our, uh, my colleague in Sydney, Dr. Fang, was able to show aggregation is actually correlates well with the microbial biomass carbon. So in this case, gypsum doesn't have any influence on microbial biomass carbon. However, organic amendment has a massive role on that. And, and what happens? is that if I want to summarize the effect of these um, um, different treatments on soil structure, when we have a control treatment and then we put gypsum and organic amendments into them into the, these soils, we, op we often see an increase in soil structural stability. When we combine the organic matter and gypsum, we see even a much, much more um, uh, improvement in, in this situation. And the reason for that is that we look after the chemistry, which is that pH, and also uh, um, the soil microbial biomass carbon, which eventually will improve the soil structure. So it's an additive effect of, in my opinion, improving a multiple soil constraints instead of just focusing on either dispersion or um, that um, poor structure of the subsoil. 
okay and we have started to see some um, um, fungal hyphae, a better root penetration and also um, uh, quite a bit of biological activities on the rip line where we have some of these amendments um, in in the field so if I want to summarize the, the, the work that I presented so far, basically uh, the deep placement of organic amendments and gypsum uh, significantly increase the yield up to 50%. Um, uh, we have a better root growth, which was associated with a better water use by the crop. And in terms of mechanisms, I think a reduction in the pH of the highly alkaline subsoils with enhanced organic uh, uh, carbon in the soil that eventually work as a glue for improved aggregation uh, led up led into a fourfold improvement into the into the soil structure so i'm just checking the time how high i'm going with the time i may just briefly discuss our our work on crop improvements okay so uh over the last five years, we have been screening a number of different um, commercial varieties and also breeding lines of wheat for their tolerance to different conditions. So this work was done in South Australia, Western Australia, New South Wales and Queensland. Um, and, and basically we wanted to see the genetic by environment interactions and how we, we can improve and cross some of these traits to, to develop new germplasm. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about today just briefly touch based on some of the variation, genotypic variation that exist in, regard, in response to some of these alkaline sodic subsoils and, and um, I won't um, go into much further details. So basically, um, we had a number of varieties over the last um, two years um, and this is just, the, the project is for five years, but I'm just talking about the two years of, um, that of the of the final stage of this project, and we were able to show a, a consistent screening in um, in a number of varieties that we used um, in this particular area. Again, southern New South Wales, highly alkaline sodic subsoils, and if I rank. Um, if I choose a couple of the high performing and top performing treatment uh, varieties and look at the pattern of water use, what is important to note here is the ability of that crop uh, or that germplasm to take water from the subsoil was related to their yield improvement. So in 2018 and 2019, hardtook in this condition was a very low yielding variety and in Iraq was one of the top and consider that 2018 and 19 was both years were really dry uh, seasons. So the ability of that um, emu rock to take up more water from the subsoil in both consecutive years um, was um, one, of the one of the reasons that we observed um, um, improving wheat yield in this condition. But across the project, um, across all the sites, um, we summarized um, the, the results into this slide, okay? So we, the blue bar and the orange bar are sensitive varieties and the sensitive varieties are based on um, the variety being sensitive to boron conditions or have a shoot to um, um, short roots and also produce low biomass. The tolerant varieties um, are boron tolerant, they have longer roots and they produce high biomass. Okay, so we, and then we categorize them into a different site mean yield. So we have a low yield environment up to from 0.5 tons per hectare to five tons per hectare. And what, it, what we are try, uh, seeing in these results is that the value of an improvement in tolerance of this variety is much more important in low yielding environment compared to high yielding environment. That graph is summarized in the, in, the, uh, in the other graph on the right hand side. So in a low yielding environment, we can, we can see an improvement in yield by focusing on germplasm improvement by up to between one to two times per hectare. However, if you already work in a high yielding environment, the value of that germplasm improvement on top of their existing yield potential is minimal. And, and a low yielding environment and a high yielding environment is basically the rainfall of that region. So the, the message here is that um, um, if we are in a low and low and 
low rainfall environment, uh, focusing on germplasm improvement actually can significantly um, uh, improve the profitability of that of that farming system. Um, also, we are screening these varieties for um, their tolerance to subsoil ESP and pH. And when um, we see quite a um, um, greater genetic variation in response to subsoil ESP, however, there is a very little genetic variation um, in response to that high pH of the subsoil. So there are consistent in ranking for the soil, subsoil properties, but ESP, um, I think there are more opportunities there to focus for geno genotypic variation. And, and finally, the conclusion from that bit of um, presentation is that there are regional differences um, in, uh, for, for varieties, and the value of multiple tolerance is greater when you have a low yielding environment. Um, and um, some of the root traits in, appear to play a role in yield, and um, in the field, we observe that sensitivity to ESP is greater than the pH, and I think for the next um, um, part of this project, we are going to focus on some of the mechanisms of how we can actually um, um, identify important traits um, to, to use for future breeding program. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick acknowledgement of some of um, our collaborators across um, a, a number of projects, and I hope um, you enjoyed it. Thank you, Esan. Um, that was great. A really neat project, I think, or projects that really highlight the complexity of um, uh, the what we need to do to improve soils and productivity. So, so as I said, at the beginning, we now have um, time for questions. I have a few here that are probably fairly simple to um, answer. Um, Esan, uh, Glenn, the right Muller, I hope I have said that correctly. Glenn wants to know um, what cost is the deep placement treatment? So, is it economic? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Glenn, for the question. This is. I would have been surprised if that wasn't the first question. So uh, the yeah. costing, yeah, okay. Uh, let me to first mention this. I can't answer these questions at the moment for a very good reason. So it's very important to do the cost effectiveness calculation based on residual effect of one of application. To do that, you need five to six years of data to be accumulated. Um, so we can have a very good understanding of from a one-off application, how many years we can actually expect a positive response in yield improvements. Um, our, um, some of our colleagues and the farmers that I know in the high yielding, high, high rainfall area, definitely they find this very cost effective and um, they spend up to a thousand dollar per hectare probably to, to adopt this technology and subsoil manuring is for them a very um, profitable activity okay in the lower rainfall uh, the cost is probably anywhere depends on what amendments you use and i tend to think um, a farm grown biomass is probably the way to go for the future as a source of organic amendments it can be anywhere from 200 dollars per hectare to six or seven hundred dollars per hectare but um to calculate the cost effectiveness is too early and I think um, we have tangible evidence that it is cost effective but it has to be tailored to that environment to that soil and making sure we can predict responses from that soil for a number of years. Elizabeth Bick has asked some questions about um, the experimental method she wanted to know how deep the inputs were placed. Um, so in the handout, you can get more information about the machinery that we use. So it was designed and fabricated by New South Wales DPI. We, uh, so it has a dual delivery depth um, capacity. We can put the amendments in a, in a banded conditions at about 18 and 38 centimeter. So really pretty much um, we go as deep as about 40 centimeter max but the amended are in not continuous in two separate band um, at two layer, um, starting from about 18 to 20 centimeter. Capacity to also put simultaneous um, nutrient, um, organic and inorganic amendments at the same time. Elizabeth also said, 
was there one application at the start or repeated yearly? So I think you've probably. No, it was that a one question. one off application. And then Dr. Azam has asked what proportion of the subsoil was amended by deep placement? No, no, it's not in the paper. So that's also a very good question. I would say um, on a hectare basis, about 50 to 60% of that one hectare is going to be amended. Okay. With, with this machinery, but, but, but Please remember, this is a research built purpose machinery. It's not a commercial machinery, it's just a prototype. And the commercial machinery will have a very different capacity compared to our work here. Yeah, that's good to remember. Uh, the next question we got in was from Steve Kimber. Um, and Steve said, did you consider the uh, stoichiometric dose of nutrients rather than simply matching poultry manure? Um, yep, that's a good question, Steve. In this particular experiment, we didn't uh, uh, consider that, but in our upcoming um, new experiments, we are, and that is exactly what Dr. Fang is working on, and the papers that are in handouts um, um, explaining that. But for the for this particular experiment, we just matched it. For the future, we will actually consider the nostrium stoichiometric analysis. And he's also asked, um, and you discussed this a little bit about the um, time that gypsum needs to solubilize in soil. And he said, was that, um, what year was the structural data from? Because he was interested to know whether pelletizing the gypsum would have affected how quickly it would sure. have um, had an effect. Yeah. So the only product that was pelletized were our organic amendments chicken manure or farm grown biomass we didn't pelletize gypsum gypsum can be applied as a as it is and the the main driver of gypsum reactivity it's the particle size so the structural data was from the third year of the project so we applied the treatment in 2017 the structural data was from um, last year which is the third year of that experiment but I'll repeat again it was just the powder ag gypsum that we use in this experiment. It wasn't pelletized. Okay, great. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, Carol Rose has asked, um, she's noted that the variety differences were often in dry years. And did you think that that would be, the results would be the same if the years had been wetter or in wetter years? Still, we have a bit of um, um, unknown physiological um, responses that we need to work out what is the reason for it. But uh, yes, in a in a low rainfall environment or in a in a dry year, we see better genotypic variation or we see um, a more um, better performance from high performing varieties compared to a, um, a, a wet year. So that means if you have enough water or it's, it's an above average season, um, the crop is okay and genotypic differences is not expressed. It's, however, it's very important that if you have a low rainfall area to make sure which variety is giving you the better yield responses. So um, our observation is over the last five years, if we have a wet year, there are less genotypic variation. And that means the plant doesn't need to put more energy to go into the deeper soil profile to get more water because there is adequate water in the shallower profile. And um, and that and 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 the better root traits of that particular genotype then is not expressed, in my opinion, in that wet year. Okay. Thank you. Um, Cameron Gooley's got a question and um, I think it might be similar to what Steve was asking. He said, can you explain how you dealt with the differences in nitrogen inputs, including the difference in nitrogen dose and supply rate from the different treatments in the first study that you presented? Um, when, so with, with our farm grown biomass, for example, if we had PHA, the PHA had about 2% nitrogen. I think the chicken manure had about 4, 4.5% 4 or maybe 5% nitrogen. So the balance, the difference was added in form of a liquid DAP, for example. So um, we, for, we knew how much nitrogen is going to the subsoil in that chicken manure and it was balanced against that. And 
the nutrient only treatment was also um, contained similar sort of nitrogen as what it was in the chicken manure in the form of a liquid DAP that we sourced from a local supplier in southern New South Wales. Um, the rate of application for the rest, I can I can provide some further details, but because I don't have it ready here, but yeah, so that was that was how we did it. Okay, great. Nigel Wilhelm has asked um, or has said the genetic study suggests that subsoil constraints are worse in low yielding environments, but amelioration work gets is getting better results in better yielding situations. How do you can rec how do you reconcile this? Um, I think you just came with the conclusion yourself, Nigel. So in in a, in a, and, and let me to connect this to the rainfall or water in the subsoil. And this is um, very important when it comes to deciding whether I need to manage my subsoil or not. If you have water in the subsoil and if you have a hostile soil condition and you are in a medium to high rainfall area, we expect um, significant responses from soil management. However, it, if it is a low rainfall area and there is not enough water in the subsoil, putting amendments into that subsoil which is dry, often uh, we have much less expectation to see any remarkable results or no results in, in some mm -hmm. cases. So in that case, um, focusing on genetic improvement of a particular crop to uh, tolerant that condition is going to be more meaningful because it costs less and also it provides uh, better results in my opinion. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, further to that, there's a few uh, questions about what you observed. So, so Steve has asked, do you see better recharge in the lower soil layers associated with the increased water use in those layers? And then David Hall has said, do you see benefits in root growth extending beyond that depth of amendment? Um, so let me to answer David David's question first. Um, even though even though we are ameliorating 20 to 40 centimeter and we can go deeper at the moment because of the machinery limitation so what happens is that um, we we improve that 20 to 40 centimeter of a hostile condition the plant will put more energy behind that so we see more roots beyond that uh, 40 centimeter now as affected by amelioration work compared to control or rip only because we fixed that layer so the plant has more energy now to to put into this deeper subsoil okay so we do see a better root growth into the deeper soil profile how deep it, it's going i think is an extra 20 or 30 centimeter that we see these benefits below that amelioration layer we also observing um, some sort of amelioration um, on a on a horizontal mode uh, beyond the ripping line. So that is very important because the rip lines are 50 centimeters apart. Um, so that means two, two zones that are being ameliorated are um, quite limited, are far from each other. But we started to see um, the, the amelioration layer to extend beyond that, um, beyond that rip line. The first question by Steve, what was that on recharge did you uh, say? He said, sorry, I've got to find it. There's a big long list of questions here. It's great. Um, do you see better recharge in the lower soil layers associated with the increased water use in those layers? So if recharge, he's, um, um, he's talking about a better infiltration rate. Um, I suspect so, yeah. So look, I think if that's the question, yes. Um, the the water uh, the water infiltration rate in that subsoil is significantly um, being improved, affected by some of the surface application. Not oh, some, sorry, affected by some of these deep deep applications of the organic or the combined amendments application, and that is directly correlates with an improved soil structure. So it's, in, it's, it's on top of the ripping effect that of course open, open up quite a bit of a space there. Uh, on top of mm -hmm. that, uh, we see that better infiltration into the subsoil. Great, thank you for that. There's a really good question here that I've been waiting to ask from Chris Guppy. He said, what of would course. you do differently given what you know now? 
Oh, wow. Backward. Okay, so Chris, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. Yes, always challenging. Um, I think for the future, what I would do differently is that I know what treatments are going to work and what treatments are not going to work. So the, the choice of treatments will be more clever. And also, um, I would put more replicates into the field. Um, this is experimental uh, work that I'm talking about because the more rep is um, maximizing the chance of getting a, a better data set. Um, what else? I think we improved our machinery since 2017 so if i want to put the next trial in um, that machinery improvement definitely will be will be one of the major uh, reasons for a better trial to go in in terms of um, yeah so but i'm happy to discuss this further over the phone because i think quite a few good suggestions will come as well that's great okay um uh we've got a question here from tal cohen um who said uh, is there any interest in investigating micronized liquid suspensions of gypsum at depth versus granular gypsum? And he said in relation to particle size and reactivity. Yeah, great question. I think yes, the answer is yes. And I personally believe the future of agriculture is in liquids. And look, um, in terms of improving the formulations of gypsum in sodic soils and lime in acidic soil, that particle size and the reactivity and mobility in the soil is going to be improved further um, if we manipulate that particle size. I, it's, it's something that I'm working actively in that area as well. So definitely um, an important area to investigate. In fact, I think from next year, we are going into the field to, to test some of these um, sub-micron size or even nano-structured lime and gypsum in different acidic and sodic conditions. Oh, okay, great. Um, Dr. Azam has asked, how do you explain the negative effect of the deep placement of liquid NPK only compared to the control? So it wasn't significant compared to the control statistically. So um, right. as I said, in the first year of the experiment, there was a slight positive response, which even that wasn't um, any different. So in, unfortunately in that situation, it says the deep liquid um, fertilizer wasn't um, effective in improving crop productivity, which is, which um, that it's, again, it's an area that I'd like to to pursue further because I think subsoil fertility could be manipulated by deep placement of, for example, phosphorus. Um, but um, because it wasn't statistically significant, that negative um, response wouldn't really worry me. Um, it's just um, there are so many other environmental factor, uh, variation, mm. and again, drought, drought, drought in both seasons. Um, that that is basically what could happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he's also asked, do you have similar trials as in sodic soil trials in other regions? Um, yes, at the moment we have nine of these trials. So two in, New, uh, two in New South Wales, two in South Australia, two in Victoria, one in Tassie. And our colleagues in um, Queensland and Northern New South Wales, uh, so John Bennett and Chris Guppy and their group also setting up a number of trials um, covering north, northern and southern region of the grain industry. Great, okay. Um, then there's a there's another good question from Carol who's, who's asked what the farmer reaction to your results are and have they asked to borrow your machine? <laughs> okay, so this is um this is a good question um in new south wales and particularly in southern new south wales um we have received a very very positive feedback um in the last three years my phone i'd receive a phone call every couple of days not only our machinery is in high demand but two of the farmers that I've been working with them in personally, um, they started to actually invest in building machinery. And one of the farmers um, is actually finalizing the, pre the machinery for uh, doing, adopting this work on his own property this season. So um, I think um, I'm really encouraged because if it wasn't uh, desirable and marketable, then it's a research that is mainly discovery not applied, but yes, so there is a, 
and significant um, significant positive response to this type of work. Of course, in the longer term, we have to demonstrate cost effectiveness and value for money and you know return on investment. But right now, as I said, um, quite a large number of farmers in the southern New South Wales district are definitely looking for some sort of opportunity to do this work on their own property. Great, thank you. Cameron Gooley suggested that we don't forget the early work by Robin Graham from South Australia who initiated the subsoil constraints work with his graveyard plots in the 1970s. There's a, a comment from Ian Packer um, that you might like to respond to, Esan, That's and Ian has said, infiltration rates seem very high compared to my experiments with rainfall simulators and disc permeometers. We never got yep. above the far 50 to 60 millimetres per hour. Um, okay, so... Well, look, um, I think the difference here is that ripping effect, to be honest, because when we have the ripping, that ripping effect is going to, so if you compare um, the control with ripping, most of the difference is coming from the ripping effect and it will open up a rip line, which is reasonably wide compared to the surface of the soil, which has nothing, and that itself in, um, improved the water infiltration. On top of that, what we are observing in a continuous flow rate um, is the improvement in the soil structure that is providing some sort of benefits to the infiltration. So I agree it's it's quite high, but I think that that, that is because of the ripline effect that open up the space for the water infiltration. But there's one more question from Lucas and um, it's a very big one. <laughs> So I left it to the last. Um, Lucas said, are there any consequences, e.g. higher EC, when sodium is exchanged by calcium from sodium bicarbonates? Um, oh, he's just repeated that. That's why it's really long. Are there any consequences? Yeah. Are there any issues with EC? Yeah. Um, when, okay, so look, um, when, is there any consequence of EC when it is exchanged? No, I don't think so. Um, I might when be right. Sodium, when yeah, sodium so, is exchanged for the calcium yeah, uh, from the bicarb. So again, no, 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 it doesn't because look, and that is the difference between a sodic and a saline soil in my opinion. For the, for the saline soil, you need to have a um, high amount of sodium in a soluble form in the soil solution but the exchangeable sodium is not going to be that high when you're exchanging it with calcium um, with gypsum to actually um, to to increase the EC to a saline condition so it should not be it should not have a consequence okay That's that was a good, simple, clear answer. Thank you everyone for those really great questions and thank you Esan for that really great presentation. A lot of people have said thank you and thank you for the really clear way you presented it and your very clear and simple answers to the questions as well. So thank you for that. And also that on that slide that you're viewing now, if you wanted to look at other webinars that we've got up um, from from previous months or years, you can do it at, two, at both of those uh, sites. So there's a DPI YouTube site and then there's a GoTo site. Um, so you don't need to miss out on anything. Thank you once again, Esan. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, we hope to see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming to this presentation.